The United States lost 52 submarines in the Second World War. As the dust settled and the wartime records of the Axis powers were cross-examined, only a handful of U.S. submarines' fates remained a mystery. Of these, one carries the unique distinction of being the only American new construction submarine commissioned during the war to undergo her sea trials and head off for the war front, never to be heard from again. This submarine, with her full complement of seven officers and 70 crew members, was the USS Dorado, hull number SS-248. One of the 1,500-ton long-range fleet-type submarines, Dorado is a Gato-class submarine laid down on August 27, 1942 by the Electric Boat Company in New London, Connecticut. She has six torpedo tubes forward and four aft, with a three-inch deck gun mounted forward of the conning tower. Launched on May 23, 1943, she's fitted out and made ready for war. Captained by Lieutenant Commander Earl Schneider, he has a year of combat experience as the executive officer aboard the USS Trigger and is eager to carry out his first assignment as skipper of his own boat. Completing four weeks of sea trials in September, he receives operational orders to get underway from New London for the Panama Canal. Departing the 6th of October, seven time-sensitive checkpoints map out a dedicated safe travel zone for the Dorado to cruise, scheduled to arrive in Panama at 4 p.m. on October 14th. This route is made known to all Allied commands to avert the possibility of mistaking the Dorado as a German U-boat and attacking her. The safety zone placed around the submarine is referred to as a submarine sanctuary, and protocols dictate the bombing and attack restriction area shall be considered to move with the submarine and extend 50 miles ahead, 100 miles behind, and 15 miles each side of the estimated track given. However, October 14th comes and goes, and as the days roll on, Dorado is reluctantly declared overdue, presumed lost. On October 23, 1943, Chief of Naval Operations Admiral Ernest King ordered a court of inquiry to be convened for the solemn occasion of looking into the disappearance of USS Dorado. Between the 26th of October and November 20th, the court convened for a total of 14 days. Their deliberations covered a score of eyewitness and subject matter expert witnesses. Evidence was examined, suppositions considered and reconsidered, and without detailed German wartime records on U-boat movements, some probable opinions were reached. 1. That there is a bare possibility that USS Dorado was sunk by an enemy submarine somewhere along the route between New London and Panama. 2. That of the other possible circumstances which may have attended USS Dorado's disappearance, the chance that she was lost through operational accident is relatively slight. And... 3. That it is highly probable that USS Dorado was lost through the attack by plane number 210P9, either sinking forthwith or being so injured as to be unable to communicate, unable to overcome the damage sustained, and, in consequence, sinking somewhat later. What is the plane attack mentioned in the conclusion of this inquiry? What clarity does post-war U-boat records provide to the mystery? Is it possible that a renewed examination regarding Dorado's disappearance can unlock the potential whereabouts of the long-lost sub? The difficulty in locating the final resting place of Dorado begins with the standard wartime operating procedure for U.S. submarines transiting from New London to Panama they would maintain radio silence throughout the week-long voyage. During the court of inquiry, this practice was questioned to determine if it was advisable to require a position report every 24 or 48 hours. Commander S. G. Barchett, the operations officer for Staff Commander Submarines Atlantic Fleet, explained that he did not believe it was wise to do so. Radio silence was in place to keep German submarines from locking on to their radio transmissions and direction finding their bearing, making them easier to find and sink. 
U.S. subs were only required to break radio silence if something had caused them to fall outside of their designated submarine sanctuary zone for the transit. He went on to state that, of all the new construction submarines that have made the passage, each and every one of them have arrived at their destination within one or two hours of their scheduled time. Due to radio silence, it's unknown which day between October 6th and 14th the Dorado met her end. There is only one mishap that sheds light towards her potential loss. The incident occurred in the middle of the Caribbean about 200 miles south of Haiti on the night of October 12th. Looking at this event with the fog of war in place, with only the information and logistics available at the time of the event, Martin PBM Mariner Flying Boat 210-P9 attached to Squadron VP-210 out of Guantanamo Bay is assigned to patrol and protect convoy GAT-52, which is traveling on a southeasterly course of 143 degrees true. All are briefed on the estimated course location, and speed of the Dorado, whose southwesterly course of 243 degrees true should pass some hours ahead of the convoy's course. Lieutenant J.G. Daniel T. Felix was first pilot and in command. A full moon supplies the only illumination on this pitch-dark evening. At 8.39 p.m. local time, a fading blip on radar 15 miles southward is detected. The plane sets a course south at 190 degrees to try to establish direct contact. At 8 miles out, the surface contact is visually sighted for the first time and Lieutenant Felix turns to starboard and begins a slow sweep around the target in order to approach it from the west. The purpose of this maneuver is to place the target up moon, where it is silhouetted against the light of the moon while also shrouding you in darkness as you make the approach. Finishing their turn onto a direct eastward course of 090, they make their approach from 8 miles out at an altitude of 1,000 feet. With 3 miles to go, the two officers at the controls and the officer at the bombing station in the nose identify and confirm the target as a submarine. At this moment of decision, a few observations are pertinent. 1. Earlier in the day, an enemy German submarine has been reported in the area. 2. This submarine under observation is roughly 20 miles north of the closest boundary line of the submarine sanctuary zone as reported for the Dorado's position. This means the mystery sub is 36 miles north of Dorado's reported location. 3. This submarine is traveling northwest on course 310, contrary to Dorado's west-southwest course of 243, 60 to 70 degrees off her base course. 4. This submarine has a very wide beam like that of a German milk cow supply submarine or a German mine layer submarine, unlike the narrow beam of U.S. submarines they were familiar with. And 5. This submarine was not sending recognition signals, as was the responsibility of American submarines to initiate. However, one must bear in mind that the plane was attempting to make a surprise attack on this submarine if deemed prudent. The question lies before you. This submarine is within striking distance of the convoy you are tasked to protect. Do you attack on the first pass and try to catch the submarine flat-footed? Or do you play it safe and make a pass over the submarine, prioritizing positive identification on the submarine as friend or foe? The first option offers your best chance for a successful attack on the submarine, while making another pass gives time for the submarine to submerge to safety or man its anti-aircraft guns and duke it out on the surface. You have moments to make your decision as you will cover three miles in only 60 seconds. What's your decision? Lieutenant Felix elects to attack and commences a slow descent at 170 knots, commanding the forward guns to stand down, providing every last second for a recognition signal to terminate the attack. Upon arrival at 8.51 p.m., they release their ordnance at 200 feet in the sequence of a depth charge, a bomb, followed by two more depth charges. These were estimated to have straddled the sub from port to starboard with a few caveats. First, the second ordnance dropped, a 100-pound bomb, needed 575 feet to arm. The fuse was set to this height to keep the detonation blast from inadvertently damaging or knocking the aircraft out of the air. 
It's therefore believed that the bomb was unarmed at impact with the water or sub, and therefore did not detonate. Second, the third ordnance in line, a Mark 47 depth charge, appeared to take its arming pin with it when it dropped. The arming pin was latched to the bomb bay via a safety cable and designed to pull out of and arm the depth charge when dropped. It should have been left dangling in the bomb bay like the pins to the other two depth charges, but was nowhere to be found later. It is reasonable then to assume that both the second and third ordnance dropped on the submarine were unarmed. The third and most significant caveat regards the purpose for all this conjecture. There is a reason the pattern dropped on the submarine is estimated to have straddled the submarine from port to starboard instead of having been observed as such. It breaks down like this. Lieutenant Felix testified that when general quarters was given to man battle stations, it was standard operating procedure in the plane for the crew to quickly test fire their guns which would have eliminated the element of surprise to the submarine. With everything unfolding so quickly and no time to spread the word, verbal cues were given to the nose compartment to stand down on the machine guns, but other than that no one else manned their stations. This meant that once the ordnance was dropped, no one witnessed the results of the attack. Not even the sounds of the depth charges were heard because flying at 170 knots, it took three seconds for them to fall and two seconds for the fuses to detonate at 30 feet underwater. By then, the plane, with its heavy engine noise, was so far distant that the explosions were inaudible. This anomaly was verified by accounts from crewmen of other planes in the court of inquiry. The only eyewitness reconnaissance happened at least a full minute later once the plane had circled back to the estimated position of the submarine. Dropping a yellow flare and sweeping the area, Lieutenant Felix reported. The flare in this instance was of very little use. Using the moon, all we could see was one large, white, disturbed area of water. Ultimately from the air, there would have been little difference in appearance between a submarine that had submerged or a submarine that was sinking to the bottom. The additional evidence of floating debris or an oil slick usually helped distinguish between the two, of which none was sighted. 210P9 reported the attack and continued reconnaissance and patrolling the convoy's route. At 9.50 p.m. they received a dispatch from Naval Operating Base Guantanamo asking directly, Details plain language, friendly sub and area. Lieutenant Felix bore this in mind when at 10.33 p.m. radar picked up another blip on the screen in the vicinity of where the first submarine was found. 210P9 turned to investigate. At 10.40, a surface submarine was again spotted on the approximate course of 310 executing a sharp turn to starboard. While flying a slow arcing circle one mile out, Lieutenant Felix initiated a challenge to the submarine with the Aldous lamp, which was met promptly with return fire from the sub's anti-aircraft guns. Taking evasive action as the tracers began homing in, the submarine vanished into a rain squall and was not seen again. Visual contact with the submarine was established for only two to three minutes and from a distance, making identification impossible. This marked the last notable occasion for this air patrol. A fresh examination of the events on the evening of October 12, 1943 reveals two points of view. The first makes the case that the submarine attacked at 8.51 p.m. was not the USS Dorado. The second makes the case that it was. One of the more urgent realizations that arose within an hour of the depth charge attack revolved around a plotting error made at Guantanamo Base Command, which amounted to units being briefed with an incorrect estimated position of the Dorado. The incorrect position placed the attack location on the mystery sub as 36 miles north and 52 miles ahead of Dorado's estimated position. This placed it outside of the bombing restriction area of the submarine sanctuary zone. The corrected position report now placed the attack location as only 7 miles north and 39 miles ahead of Dorado's estimated position and very much within the bombing restriction zone. This realization was the reason for Guantanamo's urgent dispatch an hour later asking pointedly, details plain language, friendly sub and area, and subsequent messages instructing Lt. Felix to confirm identification before any further engagements with the submarine. Post-war records also helped shed light on the night of October 12. U-boat war patrol logs revealed that only U-214, a Type 7D mine-laying variant of 950 tons, was in the vicinity that evening. 
commanded by Oberlieutenant Zersi Ruprecht Stock. She was on her way home after laying mines near the mouth of the Panama Canal, traveling a base course in the opposite direction of the Dorado that night. Syncing up the time entries from the logs, two entries are relevant. Coinciding with the first 210 P9 anti-submarine attack and subsequent flare drop for reconnaissance, Commander Stock reports, On bearing 50 degrees true, a bright yellow light on the horizon showed for a short while. Regarding the second submarine, which opened fire two hours later, EC-5277, approximately 15 degrees north, 73 degrees west. Machine guns serviceable. Aircraft on bearing 100 degrees true. Height 200 meters. Course about 320 degrees. Aircraft flies over boat, turns and intends to attack with searchlights. Fire from all own guns. Aircraft turns away at once. Three minutes later, he reports crash diving the boat. In consideration of these war patrol logs, a classified memorandum was addressed to Admiral King after the war in September of 1945, making three conclusions. 1. Attack at 2049 by plane 210 P9 was not on U-214 nor any other German U-boat. 2. The second sighting at 2240 by plane 210 P9 was U-214, who opened fire with all her guns. 3. USS Dorado was not sunk by German U-boat. Filtering this all down, let's play out the scenario that the submarine attacked by depth charge was not the USS Dorado. The only eyewitnesses to the first submarine contact were the two pilots, navigator, and bow gunner of 210P9. The description of the submarine, to their recollection, had noticeable differences from that of Dorado. The first was the absence of any duck gun forward or aft, while the Dorado had a 3-inch deck gun mounted forward. Second, the eyewitnesses generally attested to seeing wood deck planks of wider spacing than that of a Gato-class submarine, with the plank decking spanning from the bow to the stern of the submarine, while the Dorado only had planking surrounding the conning tower. A final characteristic not in keeping with Dorado is the report of a clean-cut and open, chariot-type bridge that was devoid of protruding structures such as periscope shears. Navigator, Lieutenant J.G., Paul E. Wilson, Jr., was in the nose of the plane and distinguished only a knob-like object that projected slightly above the top of the conning tower, which seemed to be in the center and forward part of the conning tower. It seemed to be a cylinder with a round top and knobs on each side. Short arms, they looked like. He was asked to sketch the submarine from memory and produced this picture stating the knob-like object is drawn larger and out of proportion to emphasize its shape, but was no more than two feet wide. This object resembles the German Uzio, or U-Boat-Seal Optic, loosely translated as a submarine aim optic. It was the device used by U-Boats to transmit ship bearings and torpedo firing data to the conning tower for firing solutions made on the surface. One can easily conjecture how the Uzio could have been the object seen by Lt. Wilson that night. Strictly speaking, the testimony of the crew's description of the mystery submarine carries the bulk of the argument against the fact that it was the Dorado they attacked. Indeed, as you read the individual testimonies of the crew's descriptions presented at the Court of Inquiry, you get the sense that the closest semblance to what they describe is a Type 9 long-range U-boat similar to the U-505. When shown pictures of Gato-class submarines, they insisted they saw no guns, periscope shears, or an enclosed bridge as evidenced in the photos. Ultimately, the problem is that U-boat records indicate that no other U-boats were operating within 800 nautical miles of the Dorado in U-214 at the time, let alone any of the 1,100-ton Type 9 U-boats or larger Type 10 mine layer or Type 14 milk cow supply submarines. Remaining on the topic of Lieutenant Wilson's description of a knob-like object, let's begin to make the case that the USS Dorado was the mystery sub attacked that night. If this were the case, then the object in question was likely her gyro compass repeater. It was the American submarine's counterpart to the Uzio at this point in the war for obtaining bearings for surface attack solutions. On Dorado, it was centrally mounted on the bridge and projected slightly above the forward part of the conning tower. If the telescopic alidade were mounted at the time, it may offer an explanation to what was seen. Of course, in hindsight, it's known that 210P9 did attack a submarine in the bombing restriction zone of the Dorado. 
Only seven miles north of its projected track is entirely reasonable for a submarine navigating by dead reckoning and checked by its last good star fix. Even the fact that the submarine was 39 miles ahead of the calculated plot for Dorado is not unusual. The close proximity of the approaching Allied convoy from the north that evening had been anticipated for days, and dispatches had been repeatedly sent to all military commands to be on the alert for friendly forces converging that evening to prevent friendly fire. The submarine was granted free range within its 30 mile wide by 150 mile long submarine sanctuary zone without needing to report in. It's not asking a lot to consider that Lieutenant Commander Schneider may have passed ahead of the convoy slightly ahead of schedule to open the distance between their crossing. As for the mystery sub sailing a course of 310, 67 degrees off the base course of 243, the Court of Inquiry surmised that given the full moon present that evening, it would have been typical for a submarine commander to commit to a zigzag course, especially with dispatches received that day warning of an enemy U-boat close by. Notably, not everyone agreed this theory adequately explained such a significant zig off Dorado's base course. Some perspective may be of help here. The USS Jack, SS-259, was a new construction boat out of New London that made the same transit to Panama six months earlier in late April 1943. In a memoir written by then Lieutenant J.G. James Calvert, he wrote of the transit, Eternal vigilance is indeed the price of survival for a submarine transiting the ocean surface. We were following a zig plan to make us harder to hit, but the only real safety lay during the day in a super sharp lookout for periscopes and at night in a steady watchfulness for lurking, surfaced U-boats, usually down moon where they would be least likely to be seen. At one point north of Cuba, USS Jack's lookouts positively spotted a surfaced U-boat on the horizon and they dived the boat for some time to avoid any danger of attack. He goes on to say that, Well after dark, we surfaced and got on our way again with a super careful lookout, and following a cautious zig plan, we continued our transit to Panama. Likewise, Lt. Commander Schneider, after receiving radio reports of a U-boat in the area, may have followed an aggressive zigzag plan. Taking this one step further, given it's now known the U-214 was approaching from ahead and traveling in opposite course, there remains a real possibility the USS Dorado's radar operator spotted the U-boat and Dorado took a 67 degree starboard zig off its base course to prevent the target from coming within firing range. Vice Admiral Charles A. Lockwood, Commander Submarines U.S. Pacific Fleet, writing after the war on the exploits of the submarine USS Harder, notes an occasion in which the Harder spotted one of her submarine packmates on SJ radar in November of 1943. The radar operator, Berg, had picked up a pip dead ahead at a range of 17,000 yards, but the usual range at which they had been able to pick up a submarine was 14,000 yards. This distance of 17,000 yards amounts to 8.4 nautical miles, and if Dorado picked up U-214 at 7 to 8 miles out and executed a turn onto 310, it would explain both her course and a slight jog to the north of her base path. The idea of a U.S. submarine zigging from her base course had clearly been a foreign one to the pilots of 210P9, as they both expressed surprise at the idea. They believed that the estimated course and speed given for Dorado would not be deviated from, giving clear indication that pilots for patrol aircraft at this time were not adequately trained in friendly submarine doctrine, a point that was specifically mentioned in the Court of Inquiry. Further scrutiny of the testimony of the four 210P9 crew members that had an eyewitness account of the submarine is also warranted. All four individually stated that they saw no evidence of the submarine's crew, as well as any deck guns, anti-aircraft guns, or periscope shears. What's interesting is that all ocean-going German submarines early in the war had deck guns. But due to the growing danger of surface attack, most of the deck guns were removed between 1943 and 1944, but only in conjunction with heavier and additional anti-aircraft guns being installed. It's telling that even though the crew mentioned specifically searching for deck and anti-aircraft gun emplacements, that none of them were able to observe any, because they were definitely there in some combination. It means that traveling at 170 knots, with only the moon's reflection for illumination made clear and detailed reconnaissance unreliable at best. At their speed, they closed the final nautical mile to target in 20 seconds. The first pilot, Lieutenant Felix, stated that his entire observation was, 
only based on a second's look. The second pilot, Lieutenant J.G. Robert Laparena, expressed the same. I was able to see the submarine very distinctly and identify it as such, but I did not observe any definite characteristics. I noticed the course. I noticed that it was large. Navigator, Lieutenant Wilson, when asked if there had been enough light to notice a mast after the sub's conning tower, stated, Yes, sir. I believe there was enough to have seen it, but due to the speed with which we passed over the submarine and the shadows that were cast, I would say that you would not have time enough to detect that. The bow gunner, Aviation Ordnanceman 3rd Class Kenneth E. Peterson, may have stated it best when questioned for details about the characteristics of the shape of the conning tower. It was dark, and everything happened so fast that I cannot be sure anything I saw was right. In part, Lieutenant Felix was influenced to attack the target on the first run due to the sub's very large beam compared to any U.S. submarines the officers were familiar with. However, the Court of Inquiry revealed that the three officers had only ever seen U.S. submarines of the small, 20-year-old S-Class of 850 tons, while Lieutenant Wilson was also familiar with the World War I-era 600-ton submarines of the R-Class. Acting as a reference point, these type submarines present narrow beams compared to the Type 9 German U-boat and the American Gato-class submarine. As a baseline, all three officers did note the attack submarine was significantly larger than the type submarines they were familiar with. When asked to estimate the tonnage size of the submarine attacked, Lt. Felix replied, I have not had enough experience in judging tonnage, but I would say that it was twice as big as a 740-tonner. A 1,480-ton submarine is strikingly close to the actual 1,525-ton size of USS Dorado. When the officers were asked pointedly if they could sketch or distinguish the silhouette between modern American fleet-type submarines or even different German U-boat types, the answer came back with a resounding no on all accounts. Even though they had been briefed pre-flight as to the proximity of a friendly sub within their patrol area, no one had inquired as to the characteristics of a Gato-class submarine. Potentially, a fatal mistake. What then can be determined having reviewed the available information? What conclusions and theories for the loss of USS Dorado are possible? For one, the probable opinions reached by the Court of Inquiry in November of 1943 and the subsequent post-war analysis remain logically sound conclusions. 1. It is highly unlikely, given the level of experience, training, and sea trials of Dorado, that she was lost solely to operational accident, even in the event of mechanical failure or operator error of some sort there were many safeguards in place to prevent the loss of a U.S. fleet submarine in World War II. 2. Due to the evidence of German U-boat war records, it is equally unlikely that the Dorado was attacked and sunk by a German U-boat, or that the submarine attacked by 210P9 on the night of October 12th was a German U-boat. The U-214 had been running on the surface for two hours before she saw the flare dropped by plane 210P9 at 50 degrees true. If U-214 was not the submarine attacked and German records account for all other U-boats at this time, then by default the submarine attacked was not a U-boat. 3. Assuming that the USS Dorado was attacked by 210P9, she could have been injured as to be unable to communicate, unable to overcome the damage sustained and, in consequence, sinking somewhat later. Therefore, Dorado could have finally come to rest some distance away from the initial point of attack. Before proceeding to more probable theories for Dorado's loss, a specific metric needs to be established before a theory is viable. Commander Jack H. Lewis was skipper of the USS Trigger in 1942 and served for nine months with his executive officer, later to be Dorado's skipper, Lieutenant Commander Schneider. When questioned during the Court of Inquiry as to whether a submarine can be materially damaged without evidence of the damage being shown on the surface, Commander Lewis's response was, I cannot conceive of a submarine being damaged to the extent that she is lost without very much evidence being left on the surface. The Board of Inquiry asked, What form would that evidence take? Commander Lewis replied, Undoubtedly oil, and lots of it, would be on the surface. Also wooden sections of the deck grating. If the pressure hull has been penetrated, and it undoubtedly would be, there would be segments of cork floating to the surface. 
I also believe that for many hours afterwards there would be a lot of bubbles breaking the surface of the water. When this statement is compared to post-war records, the argument is reinforced. Of the U.S. submarines lost in World War II to Japanese action, the Japanese records recount occasion after occasion regarding the death throes of the submarine being accompanied by debris, air bubbles, and nearly always the loss of fuel oil. The reason for this is that the fuel tanks on a U.S. fleet submarine run compartmentally along the length of the outer hull. For there to be enough damage to breach the inner pressure hull, causing flooding, one of the sub's fuel tanks was bound to rupture in the process. For days after October 12th, the area surrounding 210P9's attack was extensively searched for debris or an oil slick. An oil slick is easy to spot from the air and any evidence of oil was investigated. Samples were taken and scientifically examined, and reports were then submitted during the Board of Inquiry. No relevant debris was found, and only two oil slicks were found within 40 miles of the attack, both of which proved to be organic in nature and not fuel oil used for submarine diesel engines. Therefore, any theory involving the loss of Dorado in reconnoitered areas needs to adequately explain the lack of debris or fuel oil. One such theory often advanced is that Dorado sank by striking one of U-214's mines. After all, she was returning to Germany having just laid mines on October 8th outside the mouth of the Panama Canal when they spotted the yellow flare the night of October 12th. It's a reasonable idea worth investigating. Commander Stock's U-214 log records that he laid his entire complement of 15 German SMA mines across the mouth of the Panama Canal traveling with the current from west to east while submerged during the daylight hours of October 8th. The moored magnetic SMA mine was large for a naval mine. To put it into perspective, a German U-boat torpedo carried a 617-pound hexanite charge, while the SMA mine carried a 750-pound hexanite charge. There are then two compelling arguments against the Dorado having struck one of these mines. The first is that the Dorado's final checkpoint was 15 miles north of the mouth of the Panama Canal, for which a destroyer escort would have rendezvoused and escorted her in. The mines laid by U-214 were inland of this, roughly 3-4 to four miles south of the rendezvous point. The destroyer escort would have witnessed the Dorado's destruction if she triggered a mine. The second issue is that the mines were laid directly in the high traffic path leading into the Panama Canal. As Commander Stock laid the fifth mine, he speaks to this. Fifth mine laid. During mine laying north of the entrance, several inbound and outbound steamers passed over me. Therefore, I'm laying mines at shorter intervals. Between the shipping traffic and constant anti-submarine escort duty surrounding the entrance, if Dorado had triggered one of the SMA mines resulting in her loss, debris or an oil slick would have been spotted. But the story doesn't end here. What's intriguing is the U-214 carried along with her four new experimental EMS-1 mines. It was a small drifting contact mine disguised to look like a floating periscope. The unit was small with a charge of only 24 to 30 pounds, just enough to punch a hole through hull plating. Deployed while surfaced, the mine was taken up through the conning tower in pieces and assembled on deck, then deployed over the side of the U-boat. A water-soluble timer armed the mine 15 to 20 minutes after launch. Commander Stock received the order from U-boat headquarters early in the morning of October 12th. Lay remaining mines with longest setting within passages traversed on return crews. In the case of the EMS-1 mine, the longest setting was for six days, after which time the drifting mine would self-destruct. But were any of these mines deployed early enough to represent any harm to the Dorado? Sure enough, on the evening of October 12th, U-214's logbook reports, Laid 1 EMS, as I must be on convoy route here. An hour and 22 minutes later, the U-214 sights a yellow flare on the horizon at 50 degrees true. This was the first and only EMS-1 mine laid prior to the U-214 crossing Dorado's path. What can be deduced from this? With one reasoned conclusion, we can lay out a sequence of events. The USS Dorado was the submarine attacked by 210P9 the night of October 12th. 210P9 did not attack U-214, 
so by process of elimination, it was the Dorado she attacked. Sometimes, the U-518, a Type 9C U-boat assigned at the time to the Gulf of Mexico, is offered as an explanation for the mystery submarine attacked. However, the Caribbean Sea was outside of U-518's assigned patrol area. There is no mention of an air attack in U-518's war log, and the Kriegsmarine commander of the U-boat's war log reports U-518 marked with a definite position for October 12th in German naval grid DL-39, roughly 870 nautical miles northwest of the submarine attacked in the Caribbean Sea. The mystery submarine was not the U-518. According to the log entries for the evening of October 12th, U-214 was on a base course of about 074 degrees, traveling 9 knots on the surface. They deployed one EMS-1 mine at 7.35 p.m. and continued for 82 minutes until witnessing the yellow flare off in the distance at 050 degrees, marking the location of where the Dorado had been attacked. The one metric we can't know for sure is how far away the Dorado was to the U-214 at the time of the attack, but it's reasonable to place her between 5 to 10 nautical miles off. U-214 and Dorado were traveling base courses opposite to one another, one leaving, the other heading to the Panama Canal. When attacked and forced to dive, the Dorado was 7 miles north of her projected path. The next course correction would have been to port. When Dorado surfaced, it's not hard to visualize her course correction leading straight into the path of this singular mine. As unfortunate as this would have been for the crew of Dorado, it could prove to be the cause for her loss. We can gain some insight as to what her demise would have been like from evidence regarding the loss of the USS Flyer, SS-250, on August 13, 1944, near the Philippines. At 2200, disaster struck. Suddenly, a terrific explosion, estimated to have been forward on the starboard side, shook the ship. Several of the men on the bridge were injured, and the commanding officer was thrown to the after part of the bridge where he regained his senses a moment later. Oil, water, and debris deluged the bridge. There was a strong smell of fuel, a terrific venting of air through the conning tower hatch, and the sounds of flooding and of screaming men below. Lieutenant Lydell, the executive officer, had stepped below the hatch to speak to Commander Crowley. He was blown through it, and men poured out behind him. Within 20 or 30 seconds, flyer sank while still making 15 knots through the water. The commanding officer's opinion is that the explosion was caused by contact with a mine. Notice the mention of fuel in the account. This mine was likely a Japanese type JH Mark VI contact mine with a 478 pound charge, and it busted the USS Flyer open, as is seen by her wreckage which now lies at 330 feet on the bottom of the Balabac Strait. With Dorado, this would have been an EMS-1 mine with a 30 pound charge strikingly similar to the 30-pound charge of a hedgehog anti-submarine mortar used by the Allies during World War II. This would puncture a relatively small, yet for a submarine significant, opening through the pressure hull. If the mine struck near the bow and forward of the fuel tanks, the rapid and unexpected flooding would have run straight down the length of the sub, venting through the conning tower hatch. In a matter of moments, she would have plunged head down into the seas. With no one surviving the night in frigid waters to be spotted for rescue, no fuel tanks ruptured, and no significant debris left on the surface, nothing would remain to mark her fate. This is a plausible explanation for the loss of Dorado. There is of course one final explanation for what caused Dorado's loss. As concluded by the Board of Inquiry, it is highly probable that USS Dorado was lost through the attack by plane number 210P9. The reason the Board of Inquiry could not reach a conclusion as to her loss was based squarely on the lack of evidence supporting the case that 210P9 caused fatal damage to the submarine she attacked. How can this be reconciled? Depth charges are effective by delivering a concussion of water pressure against the submarine's hull and crushing the hull inward to rupture seams and seals throughout the boat. The two armed depth charges reportedly straddled the submarine amidships, bracketing the fuel tanks. The depth charges alone could not have delivered a knockout blow without a fuel containment breach. One could theorize that perhaps the unarmed 100-pound bomb managed a direct hit through the wooden deck plates and managed to compromise the pressure hull integrity by sheer deadweight. 
but it is difficult to attribute that much damage being sustained to the 9 16th inch thick pressure hull by impact alone. Another account from the memoirs of the USS Jack in April of 1943 may shed some light on the puzzle. In her second week of sea trials during a quick submergence drill, she found herself flooding profusely in both engine rooms. Were it not for the quick action of the crew, the Jack may have suffered a similar fate to that of the USS Squalus on May 23, 1939. On that day, during quick submergence drills, the valve to the main engine air induction was open as the Squalus submerged. This three-foot wide pipe, which provides air to the diesel engines while on the surface, caused catastrophic flooding in a matter of moments. A watertight bulkhead was sealed just in time to contain the flooding to the rear half of the submarine, but USS Squalus sank stern first to the bottom at 240 feet in less than five minutes, without an oil slick, without debris. 26 men drowned, while 33 men were heroically rescued over the next two days by the first successful use of the diving bell. In response to the Court of Inquiry investigation of the Squalus incident, the main air induction of U.S. fleet submarines was redesigned to include long-handled, manual backup flapper valves that could be quickly pulled to shut off incoming water through the main induction pipes into the diesel engine rooms. Skip ahead to 1943 aboard the USS Jack. A ghost white crew stared at a red light on the Christmas tree instrument panel, indicating an open main air induction valve. They had narrowly avoided disaster due to the crew in the engine rooms quickly closing the manual backup flappers. Retired Vice Admiral James Calvert, again speaking of his time as a Lieutenant JG on the Jack, recalled, What had happened? We had had a green board and pressure in the boat. How had the main induction valve opened? We would never know for certain but the best reconstruction was as follows. The only lever anywhere on the boat that controls the main induction is at the main hydraulic manifold, located under the Christmas tree in the control room. This manifold, through hydraulic pressure, operates not only the main induction valve, but also the main ballast tank vents and a number of other important pieces of machinery involved in the diving process. The man on the main hydraulic manifold, almost always a chief petty officer, has one of the most critical jobs on the dive. In our everlasting drive to get under in less than 35 seconds, there was a lot of pressure on the main hydraulic manifold operator. He had to do everything both swiftly and correctly. That morning, the chief on the manifold must have thought he was opening the vent of the auxiliary tanks meant to hurry the dive and instead grabbed the main induction handle and reopened that critical valve. The main induction handle is shaped entirely different from any other hydraulic handle, and thus it is not easy to see how the mistake was made. Nevertheless, that is the only way the accident could have happened. Vice Admiral Calvert's assessment of this incident was that the open main air induction failure was due to operator error, while the Board of Inquiry for the USS Squalus concluded the incident was due to mechanical failure of the main induction valve itself as there were multiple and unanimous testimonies that the main induction indicator light on the Christmas tree remained green throughout the dive, even after flooding began. What might a similar operational or mechanical incident on Dorado have looked like in conjunction with 210P9's air attack? We can only speculate. USS Dorado sails under moonlight on the night of October 12, 1943. We can surmise that the OOD, the officer of the deck, responsible for giving orders on the bridge, may have received instructions in the night order book from Captain Schneider similar to those given by Commander Richard H. O'Kane, captain of the USS Tang, SS-306, in January of 1944. Having completed their sea trials and setting off on their assigned submarine sanctuary zone from California to Pearl Harbor, Commander O'Kane concluded with these instructions. Report any changes in weather or other circumstances. If in doubt, call me to the bridge. If in doubt about being in doubt, call me immediately or dive. Remember, no officer will ever be reprimanded for diving, even though it prove unnecessary. It's 8.49 p.m. Despite sharp lookouts on the bridge, the first indication an aerial attack is imminent is the drone of aircraft engines quickly increasing in volume. Estimating there is no time to get off a recognition signal with the lamp, the OOD makes a snap decision to dive the boat as the safest course of action. This would have been the first occasion where a crash dive was no drill for the Dorado, 
as a fresh crew out of training, the adrenaline rush was immediate. As the last one into the conning tower, the officer of the deck seals the hatch as Dorado's tanks and valves execute their choreographed cycle to dive the boat. The chief of the dive goes to vent the auxiliary tanks to quicken the dive when simultaneous to him pulling the lever, two explosions violently shake the sub in quick succession, blowing out lights and knocking men off their feet. Given the timing and disruption of the charges, no one notices the green light on the Christmas tree change from green back to red, indicating the main air induction valve has reopened. In a matter of seconds, water begins catastrophically flooding into both engine rooms. Unlike the USS Jack, the disoriented crew in the darkened engine rooms initially attribute the flooding to damage sustained from the depth charges and cannot reach and react quickly enough to manually shut the main air induction backup flappers. The deluge of water quickly subdues everyone in the engine rooms as the adjacent rooms take on water. In the control room, the mistake is quickly realized and the command is given to blow all ballast. Unlike the Squalus pre-war incident, where the goal was to submerge the sub in 60 seconds, mid-war doctrine called for an aggressive 35 second crash dive which included flooding additional tanks and cutting in steeper with the bow planes for a greater down angle bubble. The quicker submersion had the opposite effect of it taking longer to reverse the dive in the event of an emergency blow. Water cascades from the engine rooms down the length of the boat towards the bow. When the water flooding the engine rooms reaches the plumbing and exhaust pipes running down the length of the boat, geysers erupt from open valves throughout every compartment as the crew frantically scrambles to control the flooding. The aft and then the forward battery compartments begin to arc in short circuit as the lights flicker out and kick over to emergency lighting. All propulsion in hydraulics to Dorado has been lost, and are useless anyway, because the flooding in the boat has already reached critical mass. USS Dorado continues to bleed out the rest of her air as she completes her final dive on eternal patrol. Similar to the USS Squalus, the Dorado is lost without damage to its pressure hull and leaves no trace of debris or oil on the surface to mark her final resting place. Though there are other possible ways in which the Dorado could sink without a trace due to the attack by 210P9, this is one rational theory explaining the Board of Inquiry's conclusion that it is highly probable that USS Dorado was lost through the attack by plane number 210P9. It's important to remember that there were a series of oversights that led to this occasion of friendly fire. The training and instruction of the officers of 210P9 should have included better briefing and practice in identifying current U.S. submarines. Additionally, incorrect navigational coordinates of the location for Dorado placed her in harm's way. If 210P9 had accurate information, they would have known they were in a submarine sanctuary zone and not proceeded to attack without confirmation. The men of 210P9 were carrying out their orders within its parameters so if their attack resulted in the loss of Dorado, they are not to blame. If anything, it should highlight the gravity of accurately transmitted intelligence. We can never know for sure what sank Dorado without an expedition being launched to find her. What is wild is the two most probable areas to locate her are remarkably close together. We know the U-214's mine was laid 82 minutes prior to sighting the yellow flare. At 9 knots, this would place the mine 12.3 nautical miles behind U-214. If the flare seen at 050 degrees was 10 nautical miles distant, this still only creates a distance between the air attack and the mine plant of 22 nautical miles. The water here is roughly 3,000 meters deep, about the same depth that the USS Stickleback, SS-415, was found by Tim Taylor of the Lost 52 Project in 2019. Was the seven officers and 70 enlisted men who gave their lives for the war effort the tragic result of friendly fire, the unfortunate event of operational error, or a chance encounter with an experimental mine? One can hold out hope that we may one day know the truth. A sad result of the lack of certainty regarding the loss of Dorado is that of the 52 U.S. submarines lost during World War II, she is one of only four submarine crews which were not awarded Purple Hearts for its crew members that died at the time of its loss. Of the other three submarines, the R-12 and S-28 were lost while on training maneuvers, while the S-26 was accidentally rammed by its escorting destroyer 
while coming out of port due to a communications breakdown. Amongst the submarine crews awarded the Purple Heart were the USS Tullaby, SS-284, and the USS Tang, SS-306, both sunk by circular runs of their own torpedoes, along with the USS Seawolf, SS-197, which was likely sunk by friendly fire from a U.S. destroyer in the Pacific. USS Dorado is therefore the only submarine crew lost in the open ocean in an active war zone which has not been awarded the Purple Heart. It is the hope of many that the U.S. Navy will correct this oversight. Sailor, rest your oar. No tangled wreckage will be washed ashore.